Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. It's really great that you've come to hear about um, the exciting new textbooks that we've launched. Before we look at the books, I just want to talk to everyone a little bit about White Rose Maths in case you're not familiar with us um, so that you get a really sense, good sense of where we're from. Um, and then we'll talk about the textbooks and we'll get a chance to have a look inside as well. So just to give you um, a starting point, White Rose Maths um, started in 2017 and there were just a very small team of people, around three people, um, trying to improve maths education. And since then, we have grown significantly. So this is our team now. So this is our amazing team of math specialists and support staff that help us um, do what we do, which is basically try to improve maths education on as big a scale as we can. Um, and one of the main things that we produce are schemes of learning. So we have a full comprehensive set of uh, mathematics schemes of learning all the way from reception up to post 16 GCSE reset and these are all completely free for any school to download and use to help them plan their maths curriculum um, and alongside these schemes of learning we have assessments as well so we've got termly assessments and short end of block assessments and again they're all free to use so many schools in the UK um, follow these schemes and use them and we've also got a growing international reach as well so some of you might already use them or be aware of them um, so that's kind of our free offer. If you want to go and have a look, it's on our website, whiterosemaths.com. Um, and the reason I'm talking about this is just that we've, we've um, very much linked what we do in our schemes of learning to the textbook. So in addition, what we offer is White Rose Maths, as well as the huge um, amount of free resources that we offer. We have some low cost premium resources as well. And these are really well thought through um, worksheets and teaching slides um, that schools can use to supplement their lessons with. Um, and I'll just answer a question that we often get now um, so that you're not confused because some people have said, oh, are the textbooks just the worksheets put into a book? And they're not, so the worksheets are separate content and they can just be used alongside the textbooks if needed. So some schools use the textbooks in class and they use the worksheets for homework. Um, but we'll have a look at how they complement each other in a little bit later on in the session. So as well as content, so as well as resources, we also do a lot of training. Um, so just to make you aware, we have lots of online training and pre-recorded training, as well as when times allow um, face to face training as well. So we do a lot across the UK, but we're, again, we've also done a lot of training internationally. Um, we've flown all over the world to deliver face to face training and it's easier than ever now because everything is also in the form of a webinar. So a lot of international schools are booking our webinars to get a really good sense for our approach to teaching mathematics. In addition, during the pandemic, we did produce a lot of um, home learning video content. So part of our offer now has become um, home learning content that teachers are also using in class for intervention groups if needed or they're being used for CPD. So if they're not sure, if some teachers aren't sure how to teach, say, a lesson on um, fractions, they're not sure how to introduce fractions, they can go and look at one of our videos, see how we introduce fractions, and it might give a bit of inspiration as well to the teachers. So we've got a whole host of uh, free videos that can be used and teaching slides as well. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of what we offer. I know it was a very quick tour, but we've got lots of resources, lots of training, um, lots of things for pupils to use as well in the classroom. And just a bit of a sense for our reach as well as White Rose Maths. So we do have a huge social media following. So if you don't follow us on social media, go and take a look because there's also lots of great things shared on there by teachers. So there's lots of things to inspire on how they're using our resources in the classroom. Um, and also if we've got any new releases, you can see what, what we're releasing. So take a look at that. 
We train around 20,000 teachers every year. So like I said, both in the UK and internationally, um, and these really help teachers understand um, what our ethos is as White Rose Maths, what our vision is, and how we feel that um, maths can become accessible to all, all students, no matter what their starting point. Um, around 80% of primary schools in the UK are using our material in some way and a growing number of secondary. Um, the last survey results showed around 40% of UK secondary schools are using our resources. And um, so we really have got a strong reach in the UK um, and we get great feedback about how it's having an impact with children, which is the main point. And then in January alone um, this year, our home learning videos were watched 14 million times. So again, that's across the world. They were accessed um, to help those children that were learning at home. So hopefully that gives you a good sense for White Rose Maths, our reach, what we do, um, just in case you've never heard of us before and you're not sure who we are. So I want to just take a quick look in a bit more detail at the actual schemes of learning. And I'm going to obviously focus on the secondary schemes of learning um, because you're here to hear about our secondary textbook. So if you've never seen it, um, these really focus on building depth in conceptual understanding of mathematics. So we're really interested in children understanding what they're doing and why they're doing it. We really try to make connections between concepts explicit so we're not just learning about something as a standalone topic in maths and then we move on to another standalone topic in maths we want students to understand that it's a connected journey that they're working through and it really allows students to make sense of the maths that they're doing we address fluency and retention as well um, and we also promote teach questioning and exploratory talk so what we feel that we do is we're really trying to shape independent and reflective thinkers who are able to reason and problem solve. So this is a dream, isn't it? This is what we want our students to become um, mathematical thinkers, able to apply their knowledge to a variety of situations. So this is what a, a yearly overview looks like. So this is from our year seven scheme of learning. And you can see the whole year is just broken down into blocks. And we've thought long and hard about the order. Um, so we've, we'll talk a bit more later about why we started with algebra, but you'll see that then we've put place value before application with number and then negative numbers a bit later on, but before fractions, because we want that interleaving into fractions. So we've really thought carefully about the order that we sequence our content. Then within that, there's a set of small steps and these are key. These come through the textbook as well. And this is really um, what's quite special about our schemes of learning, the way we break down the concept into small steps to help students get that deep understanding. And then after that, there's a page for teachers. So this is a teacher facing resource and um, to give some notes and guidance, some key vocabulary that you're going to want to use in these lessons, and then some exemplar questions of how we see that you might um, use this content to help give a really good depth of understanding of whichever concept we're on. In this case, describe and continue sequences. So that's what our scheme of learning looks like. Um, like I say, if you've not seen it, you can go and download that for free and have a look and it'll give you a really nice mathematical learning journey for your students. So I just want to talk a little bit about the rationale for the small steps that I've already touched on. Um, so the objectives are broken down into lots of small steps and every aspect of this of the small steps are examined. So the reason for that is uh, we don't want to assume any knowledge and I think that can happen quite often um, in classrooms where we assume that students know something and if we skip that little vital piece of information it could cause problems later on. So nothing at all is left to chance with the students. And it really isolates what we want students to think about. So when students are learning something brand new, we need to get rid of all the distractions. We need to isolate that key point that we want them to think about so that they can learn it properly and then apply it to other situations. 
And just to make really clear that a small step in our schema learning is not necessarily one lesson. It's just a small step in learning. So there could be several small steps in one lesson, or it could be that one of the small steps takes a number of lessons. If it's a particularly vital one, or it's a particularly tricky small step for students to grasp. So it all depends on your group as well that you're teaching. So here's an example um, of a set of small steps I just want to briefly talk through um, because I think this really highlights how it's different maybe to some other objectives that you might have used before. Um, and I know for myself when I was a young teacher in NQT, if I was given this topic, I probably would have just gone straight into um, solving equations and collecting like terms. I probably would have skipped uh, these first two, where we're really looking at the understanding of equality and using fact families numerically and algebraically to build on what they've learned in primary school. So they, those two small steps are just helping make sure that the students understand the meaning of equality. Then we move on to solving some simple equations um, using lots of different representations, which again we'll look at in a little while. And before we start collecting like terms, we want to make sure the students understand what terms are like or unlike and understanding the meaning of equivalence. And then finally, we do then get on to actually collecting like terms and it, we should find that they've got a much deeper understanding and aren't going to make some of those common mistakes that they make um, when, when doing this sort of activity. So hopefully that gives you a good idea about the small steps and the rationale, because we're going to look at the textbook overview now and you'll see how what we do at White Rose Mass then is really fed into um, the textbook and this exciting book that we've released. So we have released student book one. So this was released in March um, and this is aimed at in the UK, a year seven group, a year seven year group. Um, but because as you can see, it's not labeled like that, you could use this flexibly. So some of this content might be suitable for some, some different age children and it'll be able to be used with that. And it is um, designed for all students in that age range so there isn't with some textbook series there's differentiated books so there might be a book one a book two a book three and um, for that same year group we've not done that everything is in this one book and um, it doesn't mean that every student will be able to access absolutely everything but there is more than enough practice for all the types of students that you're going to be teaching We've also just released book two, which is exciting. So this one is aimed at year eight in the UK. Um, and then in September, we will be releasing book three. So this is aimed at year nine in the UK. So let's have a look about the rationale for the books. Um, so we've really tried to build, myself and Ian Davis, who isn't here today, um, we've tried to build a comprehensive learning journey to help build that culture of deep understanding like we've just talked about um, in mathematics. They fit perfectly alongside all our free schemes of learning, but if you have your own scheme that you're using or something different, you will be able to use it alongside that as well. Um, and that's because it it's designed to cover the whole um, UK Key Stage 3 national curriculum. So absolutely everything in that national curriculum are in these books. Um, so you can be confident that you are having full coverage. And they're designed to support a mastery approach to teaching and learning in mathematics. Um, I'm just going to show then how our small steps in our schemes are linked to the actual textbook. So if we have a look at these two small steps here. So this is about equality and fact families. And then in the book, the small steps are identified in this chapter here, uh, 3.1 using the equal sign. So this chapter covers these two small steps. And then a little bit about the mastery approach as well, just in case you're not familiar, as uh, some people may be, some people not as much, it depends where you are on your journey. Um, so what we mean by the mastery approach is, first of all, it is going to take years and years of purposeful practice. And certainly for myself, um, even though obviously I'm very competent in basic maths, 
um, through the role that I do, I find that even I'm learning more and more about simple addition as you start to unpick the concept and unpick the thinking behind everything. Everyone is able to um, master it more and more, even into your adulthood as well. Uh, and we, we use a concrete pictorial abstract approach through all our material. So through all our white rose free material and through the textbook as well. And what we mean by this is, um, obviously, because it's a book, we will use pictures of this is what we call concrete manipulatives. So things like cubes, counters, algebra tiles. So here we've got a representation of four cubes and three ones. These little blue blocks are what we use as ones. Um, and this represents an expression, 4D plus 3. And we could also express that as a pictorial representation, in this case, of our model. So again, we've still got 4D plus 3, and we can link it to the abstract. So we can see this journey here. We've got this concrete representation, an abstract representation, and a pictorial uh, representation. And you don't necessarily have to look at all these in that order that we've displayed them there. Sometimes you might look at the abstract and then link it to the concrete if you can see that some students haven't quite got the understanding. Or sometimes you might just use a pictorial representation if that's appropriate. So you don't need to always go in that exact order with this approach. The way we try to help teachers use this approach through our materials and through the books is we've introduced these symbols and you'll see these a lot. So we've got a little cube symbol there. And if you see the cube symbol in our content, that's suggesting to students it might be a good idea to use some concrete manipulatives with this question. It might help you to understand it or realise what, what we're trying to do with the maths. If you see a little bar model symbol, obviously that's suggesting why don't you draw a bar model uh, for this question. Or it might be a direct instruction. We want you to draw a bar model for this question so that we can see that you understand what's going on. Then we've got a pencil symbol. This suggests to draw a diagram, and this can be good for, for things where maybe a bar model isn't um, appropriate. So bar models are great, but they're not the only pictorial representation that we can use. So sometimes we'll draw other diagrams. Then we have a think symbol, and I love this one because um, I don't know if you've had this experience where there's quite a tricky question and all the hands go up in the, in the class because they want some help straight away. Um, but when we put this symbol next to a question, it helps the student realise that this one's a bit trickier. There's something about this question that means I'm not going to be able to answer it immediately. So take a step back, read it again and have a think before asking um, for help. And then we have the discuss symbol, because as we know, um, discussing mathematics is so important. So this encourages the students to talk to someone about their reasons or about their answer or about what links they have seen in the questions. So here's an example of how we use the symbols in our White Rose Mass Premium resources. So this is about directed number. And we've put the cube symbol there because with directed numbers, you'll see in a little uh, while, we often use double-sided counters. So this is suggesting to students, use double-sided counters here with this question. And then we want them to talk about it uh, to a partner. That we want them to say what they've noticed about their answers to that question. So alongside that, we can see how we also use it in the textbook. So here's an extract from the textbook again on directed number and you can see we're using the same symbols there we've got the talk symbol um, for them to explain what um, Jacob is doing there we all often use characters as well and then we've also got the cube symbol again suggesting it might be a good idea to use double-sided counters um, for these questions so you can see how both resources really complement each other there um, and in addition to the concrete pictorial abstract approach, we also encourage um, conceptual and procedural variation. Now, again, you might be familiar with this or you might not. So I'm just going to show a couple of examples. So here's an example for equations. And I'll just give you a moment to read that and take it in. So instead of giving the students just a set of equations to solve, um, just lots and lots of similar questions, here we've represented equations in a variety of ways. So we're using, in A, B and C, we're using the part whole model. 
Then we're using the idea of, of a balance scale and a bar model as well. And the key point here is we want students to be able to um, see equations in a variety of different con contexts. So we describe this as conceptual variation. We are varying that concept um, so that students are exposed to it in lots of different ways. And then in a different set of questions here on fractions of an amount, this is an example of procedural variation. So as you can see in this question, um, we keep in 600 the same in every single question. So 600 is staying the same, but we are changing the fraction slightly in each part. And what we want to get out of this question is not only do we want students to practice finding fractions of an amount, of course, we want them to spot patterns and think about, well, what's happening here between each one? So what's the difference between part A and part I? What's the same there? What's different and what effect did it have on the answer? Now, students aren't always naturally going to look for connections themselves. So what we do in the textbook is sometimes we'll use a character. So in this, um, in this case, we've used Faith. And Faith has noticed a few um, connections herself. So she's seen that question one, part D, is double her answer to part F. So we've got a fifth of 600 and she's found that that's double a tenth of 600. Um, and then she's also noticed that four times as big as her answer to I, that F is four times as big as her answer to I. So again, why? Why has that happened? And can they see that connection? Um, and then this encourages students to find other ones as well. So rather than just saying open-ended, what can you see? We've used a character to pull some out and then the students can build on that as well themselves. So that was a really quick look at the mastery approach. There's obviously an awful lot more to that. Um, and there's a variety of blogs on our website that you might want to read up, but hopefully that's given you a flavor of some of the things that we've put in the book. Now I just wanted to talk about um, our sequencing briefly because starting with algebra um, is quite a bold move really and a few people were, were like quite shocked when we launched our schemes and said oh you've started with algebra normally you'd start with place value and why is that? So I just want to give you a bit of rationale as to why we decided to start year seven um, with algebra. So first of all, we really feel it's fresh and exciting. They won't have done much algebra at all um, at primary school in the UK. So we want them to come to secondary school feeling a bit more grown up and thinking, right, this is, this is real maths now. This is exciting. I've done lots of number work. I'm getting into some algebra. Um, and this, this block is very much about thinking and exploring. It's not about learning tricks and procedures. So it really gets them thinking about algebra and the connections. And what we've found with schools that are following our schemes of learning is it's really helped le level that playing field when you come to secondary school. Um, some students do have, they've had some struggles maybe with number um, and maybe been switched off from maths a, a little bit, whereas others have loved it and they've come to secondary school excited about learning more. What we've found is by starting with this content, it can level the playing field because it's new to everyone and everyone can have that fresh start. And we strongly encourage using calculators with this content so that students are not held back if they're not fluent in the times tables yet or they're not sure about addition and subtraction. That does need addressing, but if we can help build the confidence in this, in this block, um, then it's just going to help them later on. So it's a really nice, exciting start for them. Then, obviously, as you can see in block four, we do then come back to place value. It is a vital, vital part of mathematics that they need to understand. Um, so here, then, we can start unpicking any misconceptions um, that some students might have. You'll also notice that we don't just cater for low attainers or students that are struggling a little bit. We do want to challenge those ones that love maths and have a really strong understanding of everything they've done. So you'll find that we use um, an H throughout and this highlights that it's a higher step. So for year seven to learn standard form, um, this is what we suggest is higher content. So with this content, you might not use it with all your students. You might only use it with the ones that are really confident with all the content um, prior to this. So we make sure we've got plenty of challenge. 
Okay, so I just want to take a quick look then at um, what a block looks like. So this is an overview of a block. And then after this, we'll look inside a chapter and look at some questions in a bit more detail. Um, right, so we're going to take a look at the directed number block. So when you start a block, you get this page. And this gives you a really nice quick visual, both the teacher and the student, of what you're going to learn in this block and what manipulatives or representations might be useful. So straight away at a glance, we can see, right, double-sided counters might be useful in this block. We've got number lines. We might use real life things like thermometers. And there's some solving equations in here, in here and we're going to use a bar model as well. So anything on this page is going to filter through into the content. Then when we get into the actual content of that block, um, you can see at the top there, we highlight our small steps again from the schema learning. So these cover three small steps, adding directed numbers, subtracting directed numbers, and using a calculator for directed number calculations. And we also highlight some key vocabulary. And you'd want to um, encourage students to use this themselves as well throughout their learning. Then we have an are you ready section and this section is just making sure that they have the prerequisite knowledge to access the rest of the learning in the chapter. So often a lot of this content will be content from chapter 9.1 for example to check they've really understood it. And then there's a models and representations part um, to help you again see, like you saw on the other page, we've got double-sided counters and a number line, but it gives a little bit more of an example of why it might be useful. So we can see here that we, we're going to use double-sided counters and we're going to use the zero pairs technique. Um, and it just asks that little question to the student, why do you think that's called a zero pair? So it can be picked up as a class as a discussion point. If teachers aren't familiar with this sort of um, manipulative, we do have the teacher guide as well that we'll have a, a look at um, a little later on. And this will explain a bit more about that manipulative and how you can use it um, in the classroom. So don't be put off by that if you're not sure. Then we move on to um, the examples and practice. So as you can see through the examples, if we are using a particular manipulative, we use it in the examples so that, again, this not only helps the students, but it might help the teacher if they've never used this sort of manipulative before. So you can see clearly how we are using the double sided counters to help with directed number. And then the practice exercise, I feel is really unique for a textbook. It really builds up um, the students to the more fluency type questions. So if you look at question six, that's more of a question that you'd expect to see on worksheets and maybe in, in other textbooks. But before we've got there, we've done an awful lot of demonstrating, reasoning, looking at misconceptions through characters, so that they, when they get to that question, they are fully equipped and ready for it. And the, the exercise builds up in difficulty. So we expect all students to complete all of this if possible. It does get hard where you get, as you get to the end. So it might be that if some students are not as confident, maybe they will only do up to say question six and seven and some of your other students might do um, all of the exercise. And you can see there on question 10 that we have um, interleaved some algebra in there because we've already learned algebra earlier in the year. So we don't want students to forget that. So at, at certain opportunities when it's appropriate, we will feed it back into our exercise. And then the purple section at the end of the main exercise is called, what do you think? Um, we know that reasoning is such a big thing that students need to be able to do. And you'll find that these questions are very much about what do you notice and um, what can you find out? What do you think will happen if we do this? So they're more open ended and very much thinker um, questions. But we would expect all students to have a go at some of these um, if they're using the textbook. So it's not just for your high attainers. So following on from the main examples and exercise that we've just looked at, we have two further sections. And this is where you might find that your students do split off. Um, some students that may have needed a bit more help during the exercise 
you might want them to try the consolidate section fully independently. So they've had some support. Can you do it now on your own? And these are very basic questions um, that we would expect at the minimum all students can do after this chapter. But then some others that have found it fine and they're confident with the learning, you might want them to try the stretch section. So this is where they can really get into some tricky mathematics. They can really push themselves and look for um, answers that questions that have multiple answers, for example, like question three there. And um, there's lots of different answers to that calculation. Um, and finally, we have a reflect section. So this is at the end. We want students to reflect on what they've just done and what key points have they thought about. So in this case, they're explaining how they can use double sided counters to add and subtract directed numbers. And then what rules did they notice? So rather than giving them those rules that two negatives make a positive, they should have discovered that for themselves through their use of um, questions and examples in that chapter. Okay, so that's a quick overview of a chapter in the book. Um, at the end of a block then, so this is at the end of the full directed number block, we have a summary page that talks through what students should have learnt, um, what they should have been fluent in, what they should have been reasoning about and what problem solving that they've used. As we know, this is a real key, key thing for everyone in the national curriculum. And then there's a little quiz there to check that they have retained that learning. And you might use this right at the very end of the block, or you might use it later in the year if you want to check for retention, say a month later, two months later, you can come back and say, oh, just try that end of block um, quiz there on directed number. Okay, so hopefully you've got a good sense now of White Rose Maths. You've got a good sense of what the textbook looks like, what the overview is. And now we'll just delve a little bit deeper into um, a chapter and look at some of the questions and the teacher guide alongside. So we've already looked at this, but just so that you can really see clearly, we have our small steps here and we have our key words as well um, at the start of each chapter. And we feel like uh, correct mathematical language is so vital that really do highlight these key words to your students and try to get them to use it, particularly in their reflect task. You'd want them to be referring back to the key words and using those words in their reflect task. Then we'll take a look at this, are you ready um, section here? So as you can see, we are just looking at which prerequisites the students are confident with. So for example, here we're checking, do they understand that these are like terms because one's positive and one's negative? Do they understand that these are not like terms because they have, um, one's got A, B, one's got B, C? And then here's the behind the question. So I'll just give you a moment. This is a teacher guide, and this is the sort of thing it would say about this set of questions. I'll just give you a minute to read it. So it highlights here question four, because question four at a glance does look a little bit out of place. Um, but this is to check that, that they understand and can use these um, directed numbers here so that it's not going to hold them back when they start to collect like terms. And here's another example of a models and representations page. So again, I just want to give you a moment to read that and take that in um, for yourselves before I talk through it. So like I said earlier, if you're not familiar with some of these representations, so cubes and counters and algebra tiles in this case, as you can see, not only would this be helpful for the student, but it's helpful for the teacher to see how we're using this manipulative and why it might be um, useful to use in this content.
And just to take that further, we do talk about it then in the teacher guide as well. So it talks about um, why they might be useful and then talks about using the equivalence symbol and that we're going to embed this throughout this chapter. Here's um, example one. So again, I'll just give you a moment, take a look, have a read. So as you can see, it pulls out things like using correct notation. Um, it talks about alph putting things in alphabetical order. So those little things that students need to know are pulled out through the examples. And again here, taking it further, um, we, we sometimes use our models and representations like we saw earlier as well. And here, um, even though it's an example, we still pull out little common errors. So this is a really common mistake that students make where they've got 2x squared plus 3x squared and they think that's equivalent to 5x to the power 4. And using these algebra tiles really helps them see why that is not the case. So it asks that question, can you see why this is not the case because of the pictures we've provided there? And then just back to our teacher guide, so back to the behind the questions. We always have a section for each chapter that has things to look out for. So these are some of the common misconceptions. Now, if you're an experienced teacher, I'm sure these have come up in your lessons already. But if you're new to teaching, these are really going to help you see, right, well, this often happens. This is often a mistake that comes up in this chapter. And then as we've briefly touched on, um, what interleaving opportunities are there as well? Um, so in this one, we can interleave the use of correct algebraic notation, we can interleave substitution, um, and there's often different, different parts of maths that we can interleave into this content. This all helps with retention. Um, and like I said, at the very start, building that coherent journey of mathematics. So here's a quick uh, look at uh, practice exercise in a bit more detail. So we can see how it's building up um, and the teacher guide talks about the fact that we're using correct algebraic notation, that we're writing um, a single term in its simplest equivalent form. Um, and it gives a tip for question three where um, you might want to encourage students to check their answers by substituting. So they could substitute m is equal to 10 and then they should know if they're correct without checking the answers or without checking with the teacher. And the exercise builds up as we go through. So we've got reasoning included right from pretty much the start. So by question five, we're asking about true or false questions and if they can explain their answers as well. And even in question four, we're looking at which are not equivalent to the other two. So students are having to reason right from the very start. Um, and then in our what do you think um, section here, again, we're using characters to pick out some key interesting points. Um, they're thinking about who they're going to agree with. And then they're looking at finding 10 different expressions that simplify to 6p. So this is a great way to differentiate um, with your class and which type of expressions are they going to work with. They could work with simple expressions or they could get some really complicated expressions that simplify to 6p. So the tasks here are often open-ended and they're often linking um, to other areas of mathematics. Um, the talking heads encourage discussion and look at different methods. And again, you can see the teacher guide here. I'll just give you a moment to have a read of that so you can see the types of things we put in there. So you can see there with question three, we were always thinking about setting students up for the next step. So the reason for question three is to think about, well, later on, they're going to have to expand two binomials and we know that this is going to help them. 
So moving on to um, example four, I just wanted to show you this one because again, it really exemplifies how we can use pictorial representations to aid understanding. And you can see the development then within the chapter. So this is the same chapter, but you can see the difficulty has ramped up now. We've got the foundation secure and we're moving on to, to some more difficult expressions. Okay. And then we have section B, practice section B. So some chapters are split into um, practice A and practice B, and sometimes um, practice A, B and C. It depends on the content. Um, some chapters will just have one section if that's appropriate. Um, so it, it does vary depending on the content and depending what's needed. You can see here in question one, we've got our cube symbol and you've seen how we could use that in the example. Um, but then hopefully you can also see that this is another example of procedural variation. So you can see in these expressions, there are a lot of similar things. We're just changing one thing as we go. So from A, where we're just using addition, we go to B, that have got the same terms, but we're using a negative there. And then when we move on to C, we're changing 3A to 3B. And what effect does that have on the answer? So another lovely example there of procedural variation. In question two, again, we link into perimeter. And this is quite early on to interleave into another area of maths, but they should have been learning about perimeter right back from in the UK year four, I think it is, that it's introduced. So they should be familiar with perimeter. So why not interleave that into this content right from the beginning? Um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to collect like terms whilst thinking about perimeter. And we've got a think question. Again, it's quite early on, but we can use this. We want all students to be thinking really deeply about expressions and about, in this case, the difference between length and width of a rectangle. Now, here's a, another look um, a bit closer at a consolidation section. So, as we said, this could be used for students that are maybe not as confident with what they've just done. So you want to take them back to the basics and make sure they've really got it before moving on. The other way this could be used though, is you could use it again in a few months time. So you've done this content and you want to check that they're, they're still great with the key points. So everyone go back, try the consolidate um, activity from that part of the book. And you can see there is absolutely lots and lots of practice here. We're still expecting students to reason. We're still expecting them to work with positives and negatives. And we're still using more worded questions as well. So there's lots of extra practice there in that consolidate activity. Again, this could be used for revision or homework as well. And then in our stretch um, activity, I'll just give you a minute to have a look at that actually. It's a really interesting question there at the top. So you can see here, this is definitely going to challenge those high attainers um, in your class. And you can see with question two, they've not officially um, looked at this content. They're going to look at brackets in book two, but they should have some familiarity. They will have um, used them before, even at primary school. So for your high attainers, you might want to challenge them um, with something like this. And again, the behind the questions links, um, it talks about question one is tackling the misconception and looks at the use of zero. And then in question two, we're investigating brackets and it suggests that bar models might be a good illustration here um, if students are a little bit unsure. Or you might even want to challenge them and say, use a bar model to, to show your thinking, please. And then the reflect activity. So here we want students to describe in their own words, using correct mathematical vocabulary, how they simplify an expression involving all like terms, and then how they simplify an expression involving like and unlike terms. 
And they really are those key points from this lesson. This is what we want them to understand at the end of the chapter. Here we can see in the Behind the Questions book, we would want to encourage students to use the word coefficient with their answers. And that word will have been in our um, keywords at the start of the chapter. So encourage them to use that vocabulary so that later on they're really familiar with it and they can use it fluently. Okay, so some key points from that. Um, as you can see, it very much supports a mastery approach to teaching and learning in mathematics. We have one textbook for each year group, but with differentiated content. And I hope that has come through in those examples. It's linked to the White Rose Math Schemes, but it can be used alongside any national curriculum aligned scheme or any scheme, to be honest. Maths is maths, so I'm sure it'll be useful no matter what you are using. You'll find that hard to teach topics are not glossed over at all in these books. Um, even the most difficult to teach topics. So uh, it was Ian that authored the constructions topic, for example. And that can be glossed over often, um, but we don't do that. We still teach it for understanding. We still look at lots of different um, examples and we still interleave content into those blocks as well. Um, it really supports teaching for understanding. And as you can see, fluency, reasoning and problem solving are very much within everything that we do. And what another thing that's, I think, really great about these books, especially when you get to book two and three, is we don't just assume that they know everything that they've done before. It still builds them up as well, because students are going to forget some things. Of course, they are. They've got a lot of different topic areas to learn about. So when we're in book three, we don't assume that they know everything about equations and only learn about equations with unknowns on both sides. We recap. Um, basic equations and then go into equations with unknowns on both sides. So a little bit more about the behind the questions. So this always gives the rationale for each chapter and it links forwards and backwards. It shows um, teachers how they might use models and representations with their groups. It highlights possible misconceptions that are going to come up in that chapter. Talks about interleaving opportunities, what examples might you use? Um, and there's a brief analysis of each question in every section. Um, and it talks about what scaffolding and stretch you might use if that's appropriate as well. Um, and they are all editable, these as well. So it helps you make it your own for your class. So if you've um, if you've just taught a chapter and something in particular with your group has come up, you can edit that part in the behind the questions to remind yourself, right, this is what happened with this chapter. I know I need to come back to it um, for whatever reason has come up with your group. And like I just said, yeah, you get access to an editable digital version. OK, so next steps then. Hopefully you've really enjoyed that and you think they're brilliant. Um, so you can sign up for a free evaluation pack with some example chapters um, and the link is on there and I'm sure someone will pop it in the chat as well. Um, and you can contact Collins directly for details of any packages, ebooks, licenses, etc. And that's all from me. So a lot of talking from me, but hopefully I've left, I think I've left 10 minutes for questions. If you've got any, or some might have come through already. Um, I just want to say a mass, massive thank you um, and also to Collins as well. It's been absolutely brilliant working on this project uh, with Collins and we're just so excited about the book. So thanks everyone and I'll take any questions now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was a brilliant presentation and I hope the people watching have taken something from that. Um, before we move on to the questions, I just want to say... Uh, as I said at the beginning, we will be sending a recording of this presentation to you after the webinar. Um, and also we'll be able to send you a certificate of attendance. Um, so moving on now to the questions, we have one here. I know that we have um, Katie Sargent on the line as well, who is our secondary publisher. Um, she may be able to help with some questions as well in case, but, um, Kevin has asked, 
are the answers included in the textbooks or are they separate or in the teacher's guide? Um, the answers are in the back of the textbooks. Excellent. Yeah. hope that answers your question, Kevin. Another question I had was, um, can the books be used with any curriculum? Do you have to follow White Rose Maths uh, schemes of learning to use them? Um, no, you can use them with any curriculum at all because it's got that full coverage of the Key Stage 3 curriculum. So all the content is there and you can use it in whichever way uh, you want to use it. Excellent. Um, another question we have is, can you use the books with uh, Year 8 and 9 classes if you haven't covered Year 7? Yeah, that's quite a common question, actually. And yes, absolutely you can, um, because as I just mentioned then at the end, we do tend to recap a bit of content in book two. So um, a good example is probably equations where we move equations on in book two, but we don't assume they've retained absolutely everything from book one. Um, so you should be able to pick that up, even if you've not used book one. Okay, excellent. Um, I know that you just recapped on what's available, um, but could you clarify if there are digital versions available of the books? I think that's one for Katie, really, the digital version. I know there is, but Katie knows better than me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yes, there are. So um, we have ebook versions available of all the student books. Books, um, and details of how to purchase those um, are on the Collins website and you can use the ebooks online um, or offline as well which is really helpful if you so you can send the ebooks home with your children um, to use for homework um, as well but yes all the details are available on the Collins website. Brilliant thank you Katie um, and if you are interested in trialing any of the books, you can contact us um, at collins.international at harpercollins.co.uk um, and we'll be able to set you up with a trial access as well. Um, so another question that's come through is how do, the, how do they fit alongside the free resources and the premium resources you have? Are the questions the same? Okay, yep. Yeah. So um, they fit alongside in the way that the order is. So it's in the same order um, and you can see the links to the small steps. Um, so that's where they do link. But like we've said, they can be used flexi flexibly. So you could use a textbook without the schemes. Um, in terms of our worksheets, so our premium resources, they are totally different questions. So you may choose to just use the book. To be honest, that might, that was more than enough practice in there. So you might just use a book. If you did have access to the premium resources as well, um, you could use them as extra practice, revision, homework. Like there's always a need for more practice. So you could use them and you can be confident that they're totally different questions. So you've just got even more practice really on the same topics. Brilliant. Um, Kevin has come back to the question we had before. I don't know if Katie will be able to touch upon this, but are the digital books just PDFs, like flat PDFs, or do they have any interactive features? Um, yep, yeah, um, so they are just um, flat PDFs of the content, because um, that's the kind of the key elements um, in the course. Um, but if you buy them as eBooks, then um, through the Collins e-reader platform, then you can use the annotations um, to sort of make them for each student to make them their own. But yes, they are just the flat content, just to be clear. Brilliant. I know um, in the presentation you touched upon this as well quite a lot, but um, how are the books differentiated and can they be used for all pupils? Yeah. Um, so first of all, there's a lot of content in there. So I think to cover absolutely everything with every student would probably be difficult because there's so much content. So you're going to have to differentiate. Um, so with students that are lower attainers, we would expect them all to try the main exercises and probably then move on to the consolidation. That's probably what they're 
they're going to work on, given they're probably going to have some gaps in the learning. Um, for others, so that's say with your, your low attainers that you know have got some gaps. For probably main students, you'd be looking at them completing everything probably apart from the higher steps um, and they would complete exercises, definitely the what do you think section. And then at that point, I think depending on the topic for that child, they'd either do some consolidation or they'd do some stretch because sometimes they, they might find one concept quite easy. So they'd go on to the stretch, but they might really struggle with another concept. So they might do a bit of the consolidate. And then with your higher retainers that really need the challenge, Again, you'd want them to do really most of the exercise because the, the key points are really in there. And like we've talked about, you don't want to gloss over this, but they are much more likely to then go on to do your stretch activities. Um, it's really going to challenge them. There's definitely enough challenge in there um, for those students. So that's kind of the way I would, with my classes, that's the way I differentiate. I just choose the sections appropriate. Um, but a real, really important, actually, I can't stress it enough that don't always keep it the same depending on the, to the topic. So you might think your group are, or maybe they are low attainers, but they might just find something, something might click with them in, in a different area of math. So do push them on, let them have a go at, at stretch if they've found that concept that they've grasped it. You know, don't put a cap on um, your students for sure. Brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Um, we're almost at the end. Someone has asked if there are hard copies available and we have um, clarified that we do have both print and ebook versions. Um, two of them are available in this month. The, the third level will be available in September um, as a hard copy. So do um, get in touch with us if you are interested in, in taking a look at those. Um, so thank you very much, Caroline. I think we'll end it there. And thank you, Katie, for helping with some questions as well. Um, and yeah, hope everyone has a nice rest of their day. And thank you for joining. Take thank care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.